Good morning and welcome to Trinity on the sixth Sunday after the Pentecost. So glad you're joining us this morning. I'd invite you to join along by opening your Book of Common Prayer to page 355. And beginning at the top, Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game. 
but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will continue our worship by reciting Psalm 65, which can be found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 672. You are to be praised, O God, in Zion. To you shall vows be performed in Jerusalem. To you that hear prayer shall all flesh come because of their transgressions. Our sins are stronger than we are, but you will blot them out. Happy are they whom you choose and draw to your courts to dwell there. They will be satisfied by the beauty of your house, by the holiness of your temple. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. You make fast the mountains by your power. They are girded about with might. You still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the clamor of the peoples. Those who dwell at the ends of the earth will tremble at your marvelous signs. You make the dawn and the dust to sing for joy. You visit the earth and water it abundantly. You make it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for so you provide for the earth. You drench the furrows and smooth out the ridges. With heavy rain you soften the ground and bless its increase. You crown the year with your goodness and your paths overflow with plenty. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing and the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadows cover themselves with flocks and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let them shout for joy and sing.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Jesus went out and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of sowers. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what's sown on the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arouse on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, and another sixty, and another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, this morning we will be looking at the book of Genesis. You might notice that track one in the lectionary has been going through the book of Genesis. And it's a wonderful book. I love the book of Genesis. And so we're going to spend a little time in Genesis over the next couple of weeks. But it's the word that literally means beginnings. It's God's story of beginnings. It's the beginning of creation as told by God. And as we all know, the story begins with creation. Of all things, including man, for a time, man was happy. He was in the garden with God, and there was no sin. But then sin slipped in, and thus the beginning of God's redemptive story for mankind was unleashed. I've heard it said that everything in Scripture flows out of Genesis. And if you get Genesis wrong, you get the whole Bible wrong. Our understanding of Genesis is vitally important. And that is the idea that the Bible is primarily about God and his work for humanity, not about us and our work for him. And so with that said, make no mistake, God is restoring humanity and building his kingdom. And he is going to do what he said he was going to do in the very beginning. And he's going to do it in a way that he sees fit. And this includes the promise of making a great nation. A great nation that began back in Genesis 25, as you heard read just a moment ago in our first lesson. Now, to set the scene, Isaac is being given a wife. He was a picky dude. He had waited 40 years before settling down with the right girl, the girl of his dreams, Rebecca. But there was a problem. You see, Rebecca could not have children. She was barren like her mother-in-law, Sarah. And so it is here in the story of redemption that God steps in to do what he set out to do. And that is where the story begins, picking up in verse 19. It says, 
These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethel, the sister of Laban, to be his wife. But there's a test. You see, after 40 long years of looking for the right girl and nothing, Isaac still is not married, and his mother by now is dead, and Abraham is well up in age, and he's getting antsy. So Abraham steps up, and he sends his servant back to his homeland to find a girl of his kindred in the land of Mesopotamia. And there the servant finds Rebekah, and he brings her home. And thank heavens, it's love at first sight. Finally, marriage has happened for God's chosen, and they let no time pass. They immediately start trying to have children. But there's a problem. As I said a moment ago, Rebecca was barren. This is the test. And I can only imagine that Isaac does everything he can to fix this. They go to the town doctor, perhaps, to no avail. And so at the end of his rope, and out of ideas, Isaac prays to the Lord. I love what it says in verse 21. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife. That word prayed is the word athar in Hebrew, and it literally means to plead. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on his wife's behalf to give her children. He does what Abraham, his father, didn't do. Abraham took matters into his own hands when his wife Sarah could not have children, and he had a child with his maid. But not Isaac. He turned to the Lord in his time of need. When the test came, he turned to God. Now, here is where many times we turn this fruit of a gift called prayer into a new law. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this passage preached. And the passage quickly takes a turn. They take this wonderful gift that we have called prayer, and they turn it into a new law. You may have heard sermons like this before. Something like, husbands, the best thing you can do for your wife is to pray for them. And if you're not, then shame on you. You need to take the example of Isaac and start tonight praying for your wife with the unsaid statement, if you don't, then you're bad. But friends, that's not the point of what's happening here, and it's not the gospel. Isaac did not plead with the Lord because his rabbi the week before in synagogue told him he should. No, he prayed for his wife out of desperation, out of, I can't do this anymore, and she can't do this anymore. I can't fix this, and I can't fix her, and I need help. Help me, Lord, and my lack of faith was the plea. You see, he knew that the promise of God was to bless his line, and he knew that God was going to do what he said he was going to do. In a way, he prayed, Father, not my will be done, but your will be done. Now, of course, Isaac wanted children, just like every other Jewish couple, but he was more concerned about God's plan for fulfilling his covenant and blessing the whole world through his line. And that is why we see Isaac praying with his heart bent toward heaven. He is at the end of himself. And some scholars believe this was a test for Isaac to bring him to the place of utter surrender to God. We have seen this type of test before, haven't we? God had to bring Abraham to that place, and he took time with Abraham. Over and over and over again, we see God's patience and grace upon Abraham. As he mercifully killed the old Adam, so to speak, in Abraham, a.k.a. the sin that was in Abraham. Friends, the Lord does the same for us. He mercifully kills us over and over and over in an effort to draw us to himself, in an effort to 
raise us to new life in Him. In our fast-paced, gotta-have-it-now culture, waiting is not part of the equation. But God uses times of waiting to grow us. And we often see that no is not necessarily always a hard and fast no, but sometimes it's wait. Wait and trust me. You see, I have found in the tough times of waiting, God has used it to do three things in, in my personal heart. Number one, waiting always deepens my insight into what I really need. I often think I need or want something, and it's not until some time has passed that I can look back and see, I didn't really need that, nor did I really want it. Number two, waiting has expanded my understanding and appreciation of his answer. I think we all can look back at what God has done and see that all things, good and bad, have worked together for good. Waiting allows us to see that. And number three, I've noticed that waiting provides space. Space for me to mature so that I'm ready for the answer. God knows us. He created us. And he will never put more on our plate than we can handle. You say, Jonathan, you've not seen my plate. It's, it's overflowing. Well, if it's on your plate, you can handle it. If you are here today and you feel overwhelmed, your plate really feels like it's overflowing, stop. Stop trying to fix it. Stop improving it. Stop manipulating it. And cry out to God. That's what we see Isaac doing. His plate is full and overflowing. And he can do nothing to open the womb of his wife. So he cries out to God. Not because the rules say so. Because it's all he has left. The one who can move mountains is the one who has given him a promise. I get the impression that Isaac knew God was at work, but he didn't know. He knew God, but he didn't know. But God has a way of getting our attention and teaching us his will. Richard Hendricks, the theologian, once said, Second only to suffering, waiting may be the greatest teacher and trainer in godliness, maturity, and genuine spirituality most of us ever encounter. Listen to that again. Second only to suffering, waiting may be the greatest teacher and trainer in godliness, maturity, and genuine spirituality most of us ever encounter. Friends, this has been true for me practically and spiritually. We tend to have this same heart as Isaac, knowing God is in control, but not really knowing God, or maybe it's not trusting God. And we tend to want God to answer and to jump when we say to the instant society we live in encourages that, doesn't it? Everything in our life, for the most part, is pretty instant. We have instant coffee. We have instant breakfast. Who here this morning had some instant oatmeal for breakfast? Or maybe you're like my daughter. She's way into the instant microwave Campbell soup, chicken noodle soup. We live in a microwave culture that encourages this attitude. It actually tells us that it's okay to demand instant gratification. Heaven forbid that we have to actually wait for something. But the kingdom of God doesn't work that way. God's church doesn't work that way. We don't tell God what to do. He tells us what to do. And he does it his way and he always does it in his time. Every time. Because time is ultimately in his hands. Psalm 31, 15 says, My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. 
These are words spoken by another man at the end of his rope, crying out to God, not because the rules say to, but because he has to. He has nothing else to cling to. That's the good news, my friend. God has ordained the steps of every one of us in this church before the beginning of time, and his will and his mission will go forth regardless of what we do or don't do. This is a common theme throughout all of Genesis and the Bible for that matter. And you see that very clear in this passage today. It would be 20 plus years of waiting and wanting a child and pleading with God before God blessed them with twins. And the scripture says the twins struggled within Rebecca. Now we're running out of time. You guys need to listen a little faster. Here, listen to what happens. Verse 22. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. I get this funny picture in my head of two little babies going at it in the womb. I don't even know what that's like or how that's possible. I have this idea in my head that it was like WWF or WWE or maybe an ultimate fight club. Jacob has Esau in a headlock. I'm not sure what was happening, but Rebecca is miserable. The struggle going on in Rebecca's womb was more than just normal fetal movement. It wasn't just a little kick or a little elbow there. It was like a war raging in her. In fact, the Hebrew word used indicates that the children smashed their heads together inside of her. The literal, literal word means to smash. It has the idea of skulls being smashed together. You see the word in Judges 9, 53 and Psalm 74, 14. We also see this word used over in Isaiah 36, 6, and it has the idea of reeds being broken. It's a violent struggle within Rebecca's womb. There was a womb warfare going on, a war that would continue the rest of these boys' life. Another sermon for another day. And so Rebecca is now at the end of her rope. And so what does she do? She cries out to God. She cries to the Lord. An example that she saw her husband do 20 plus years earlier. And her cry is simply this. If it is so, why? If it is so, why is this happening to me? You can hear the plea in her voice. Why then did I ever become pregnant? Why do I even go on living? Did you catch that? Rebecca was so puzzled by the internal struggle so much that she prays to God for an answer. In the face of infertility, Isaac's response is to pray. And now in the face of a difficult pregnancy, Rebecca's response is to pray. Isaac and Rebecca both knowing and worshiping God. And now, at the point of a stretched faith, they turn to him rather than to each other or to their friends or to the world for answers. They turn to God. Now, why is that important? Well, because it shows that their faith is real. And so at this key juncture in their life, she goes to God. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there today. Maybe you need a little wisdom for life today. Turn to God. Fall toward God. Again, not because I say so, not because the rules say so, but because you desperately need to hear from God today. Fall to the one who knows you by name and has it all worked out for you. James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, 
who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Isn't that good news? To know that the phone line to God is always open. He is always available to those he died for. Friends, as we wrap up this sermon, I want to remind you, as I did last week, that you are loved more than you could ever imagine. You are more valuable to King Jesus than all the gold in the world. And because that is true, you can fall toward him in prayer with anything. As I said a moment ago, prayer is a fruit that is gifted to you as a child of God. It's a good seed scattered on good soil, as we heard read in the gospel lesson earlier today. And it will return a yield. It will. Listen, we don't pray to turn him to us. We pray to turn our hearts towards him because he cares and because he's there. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all of your worries and cares, not some of them, not just the big ones, cast all your worries and cares upon him because he cares for your soul. So let's do just that today. Let's go to the one who knows us by name and let's allow our hearts to be bent toward him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us just the way we are, not as we should be. You love the good and the bad of us. You've come and you have died for the good and the bad and the ugly and the beautiful. You've come to rescue us and to redeem us from ourselves. And we can honestly come to you with honest hearts. We don't have to pretend. We don't have to have it all together. We can fall towards you. We can cry on your shoulder. We can scream and yell if we need to. We can smile and worship if we're in that place. We can come to you anytime we want to. And you're always available to us. And so, Lord, I ask right now for my friends who may be worrying about the future, give them peace today. I pray for the one who may be struggling with infertility, give them peace today. I pray for the one who is worried about their job or their wayward child, give them peace today. Lord, I pray for my own soul and sanity that I may be the rector that this parish needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us now profess what we believe to the words of the Nicene Creed found on page 326 of the Book of Common Prayer. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and he sitteth at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
Amen. The Prayers of the People, Form 4, found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 388. Let us pray for the Church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that during this time of isolation from one another, the people of Trinity Church may be united by your Spirit and held in your loving embrace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for the new rector for our parish. May Jonathan and his wife, Jana, and their children, Noah, Lily, and Caleb, thrive with their move to Upperville and the life and ministry they will have here. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land, especially Donald, our president, Ralph, our governor, and all with responsibility for leadership in the time of crisis, in the ways of justice and sound judgment, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. We pray especially for those whose work puts them in personal danger. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all in our land who are yet to experience the full promise of your highest ideals. May we, as a priestly kingdom and a holy nation, be united in our commitment to justice for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless those of our extended community who are hungry or without work. Be with all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We pray especially for all who have COVID-19 and all who minister your healing gifts. Give them courage and hope in the face of challenge and bring them fullness of strength in body and spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, Ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pause and confess our sins to a loving God. Join me in praying the confessional. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all of your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Now may the peace of the Lord be always with you.
Once again, I would like to invite you to this table, reminding you that this is not my table, it's not Trinity's table, it's the Lord's table. And it's for all of us who call on the name of Jesus for salvation, we are invited to come and to fall towards him, asking him to receive us afresh and anew, and he's faithful to do it. And so be reminded, as I place that host up in the air, and as I pop it and crack it, it's a reminder that the body of Jesus was broken for you. All of your sins, past, present, future, were put on Jesus and he died. And then as I take that cup and I hold it up, let it be a reminder that the blood of Jesus was poured out in abundance for you to wash you 100% clean. There really is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so if you call the name of the Lord, I invite you to this altar rail virtually to receive a fresh and new from your heavenly father who loves you just the way you are, not as you should be. Our service will begin in the Book of Common Prayer, page 367, using Eucharist Prayer B. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and by the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ, our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from all evil and made us worthy to stand before you in him. You have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his commandment, O Lord, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread 
and this wine, we pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be accepted through him by sanctified by the Holy Spirit in the fullness of time, Put all things in subject under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all the saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in everlasting life. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in everlasting life. Our post-communion prayer can be found on page 365. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of God be with you this day and every day until we are reunited again. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.